Thank you. Well, thank you, everybody. Uh, you know, when, when Larry asked me to to do this event, I was uh, I was honored uh, as I met many of the professors today and, and a few students. Uh, even more honored to be here at LMU. So, appreciate you, everybody, uh, taking your time out tonight uh, to to listen to me for about an hour, hour and a half, and, and uh, ho hopefully I can bestow upon you some of the things that you'll be facing as, as students that'll be graduating in one to four years and, and what you need to do to apply what you've learned here at LMU uh, when you get into the business world. So, you know, um, the, the, uh, the agenda tonight, it's, it's not meant to be a research, it's not meant, meant to be just me up here talking about um, thoughts and, 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 and other, other areas in terms of environmental, social, and governance issues. But what I wanted to try to do is talk to you about Tetratech and how we actually um, apply the, these philosophies that, that you're learning about, that Larry talks about as part of the, um, the ethics committee that he runs. And how, do, how does a company like Tetratech actually apply those, those ideas to, to our business every day? And what is the value to that, right? It, it's, it's easy to say I'm, I'm, I'm for the environment, I'm for social issues, I think governance is, is a must, everybody has to do these, but there has to be some sort of um, economic factor also that otherwise we can't afford to do what we want to do. So um, tonight I get to talk about Tetratech. I've, uh, I've been at Tetratech for about 14 years. Uh, the company has grown from uh, you know, a small public company to a relatively uh, good medium-sized large public company here in Southern California and so uh, what I get to do every day I get to talk to you guys about that um, so the first thing is talking about our business model client service you know we're not we're not a uh, household name like coca-cola or Pepsi or somebody like that so I want to give you at least a little background on who Tetra Tech is and, and what do we do uh, second thing I want to talk about uh, how Tetra Tech is actually implemented these ESG ideas in terms of implementing environmental, um, environmental, social, and governance issues into our um, into our business model every every single day, and um, and then what what's going out there in the world? So, you know, uh, as as Larry indicated, there's a lot of uh, political issues out there. There's a lot of um, uh, new regulations that are coming up or supposed to be coming up, and how are those impacting? environmental, social, and governance issues um, for both business and government. And then finally, um, how, do, how do we bring all this together? Why do we do this? Um, like I said, it's, it's, it's nice to talk about ESG items, but we also need to talk about the economics. So as business students here, one of the things that you want to learn to do is, what do I need to do to create a company, to create value, to create value for our shareholders? and um, uh, what I want to talk about tonight is what Tetratech does with ESG to create that, that value for our shareholders. So first I thought I'd start off and just talk about, you know, what is ESG? So uh, as you can see here, it's environmental, social, and governance issues, all wrapped around this idea of what, what does an ethical company do? Um, but beyond just the ethics of what a company does to apply ESG, um, there's also economic factors that, that need to be involved too, so that um, A, there's a return to shareholders, and B, you, you create value and, and uh, to be able to grow your company, to be able to uh, invest in, in larger, more dynamic um, ESG items. So a little bit of background about, about uh, TetraTech. We are our consulting and engineering company that's based in Pasadena, California. We're focused on water, environment, infrastructure issues. Um, the company is, is, like I said, headquartered in Pasadena. Um, we're very much a uh, client-focused model. Uh, we, we have over 60,000 projects that we do for our clients around the world every year. So every one of those clients is important. Every one of those projects is important. And, and, be, and the reason they're important and, and what our business model is based on is this, the top of this uh, uh, pyramid. So we're very much focused on working on the front end of projects. So if you look at, a, if you look at an issue, an uh, infrastructure issue, building a dam, 
you have to do a lot of front-end work on the engineering side, the design side, um, doing a lot of the mathematics on what it's going to take to build a dam. So we're focused on that front end, whereas constructors are focused on actually building. So you could say that that, that front end, leading with science, that's where a lot of the smart PhDs and engineers and scientists actually do their work, and that's, that's what we do at Tetra Tech. So how did Tetra Tech get started? Um, we actually started about 50 years ago. We just celebrated our 50th anniversary in, in December. Uh, we started off as a, as a water company by four very smart technical guys. Um, grew that work into uh, working on environmental issues, working on infrastructure, actually taking that applied science and, and uh, turning that into an actual infrastructure project. And then uh, ultimately going outside of the US and working on international projects um, all throughout the world. As I said, um, it's our 50th anniversary and, and um, just so happens to be our 25th anniversary since our IPO, so as a public company. So uh, last year, not only did we get to celebrate the 50, but we got to celebrate the 25th with the opening of the, uh, the NASDAQ. So when we look at, so just a little bit more background about Tetra Tech. When we look at the, um, where the company has been and where we are today, um, 25 years ago, we had about 25 million revenue. Uh, today we're about 2.6 billion. Uh, 25 years ago we'd have had about 350 employees. Today we have more offices today than we had employees 25 years ago. And um, 60,000 projects, so you think about how many projects, how many clients that we're doing around the world uh, with 16,000 employees. Uh, it's just incredible in terms of the, the technical capabilities of our engineers and our scientists and, and what they do for our clients every single day. One of the things that, that also sets Tetra Tech apart is in the United States, um, as, as ranked by Engineering News Record, we're the number one firm and have been for the last 14 years in terms of consulting and engineering for the water, um, you know, water issues in terms of water quality, water sourcing, um, and a market leader in, in uh, uh, environmental science, uh, solid waste, and, and uh, the actual desalination and treatment of, of uh, polluted water. So one of the one of the questions that I had was, um, you know, who are our clients and, and you know where are they? So back in 1991, as a, when we first went public, almost 99% of our clients were U.S. federal, state, and local clients. Today, we're a bit more balanced. As you can see, we're about a third uh, federal government clients, um, about a, th a third international clients, and about a third uh, commercial. And who are those clients? Uh, it's the Fortune 500, it's you know, the Department of Defense, it's uh, the state of California, it's the city of Los Angeles, um, all across the United States, all across Canada, Australia, U UK. Uh, that's, that's where our clients are, and these are our, some of our longest term clients. So what, what do we do for our clients? I think what I wanted to do was share just a couple of um, environmental and, and uh, uh, I'll call it iconic projects that, that we've done for, uh, for our clients. One was uh, the Panama Canal. So with these larger ships and um, uh, you know, uh, larger cargo ships, the Panama Canal as it stands today or, or a couple years ago could not handle these, these larger, bigger ships. So um, a second canal was built. What we did was, um, uh, for environmental purposes, we needed to design the water savings basins, the, the inlets, the outlets, um, a lot of valves, a lot of mechanical project or uh, moving parts so that the sustainability features that, that were there that were required by the Panama Canal Authority, they wanted to make sure that there was an environmentally uh, sustainable uh, canal that saved the water, that, that was able to reuse the water. So you think about these large cargo ships that, that come into the canal, uh, displace all this water, so where does that water go? It goes into these water saving basins. Once the, the ship leaves, the water goes back in. Other, rather than you know, pumping water in and out of the ocean um, that's you know, about 100 miles away. You know, another um, iconic project, and this is uh, fairly timely with, with the other hurricanes that have occurred in, in Houston and, and uh, you know, Florida, is um, 
uh, down in New Orleans where there was massive flooding and, and the infrastructure just wasn't built to, uh, to withstand a 100-year flood. So Tetratech, what we did for environmental and sustainability issues was we actually designed and, and built the uh, surge protector barriers um, that you see, or if, if you were down in uh, New Orleans, all along the Mississippi River and in, into the, uh, the Gulf. And the reason that's important is, um, you know, rather than replacing the levees that have, that have been there, uh, which weren't, weren't going to withstand a 100-year flood, um, the, new, uh, the new levee system and barriers uh, will. So that's a little bit about Tetratech. Um, like I said, not a household name, but I think it's important to understand uh, you know, what the company does, what we do, and, um, and how that relates to, uh, uh, I guess, the rest of the, uh, the, the uh, presentation. So our sustainability uh, mission is to really embrace sustainability in, all, in the business that we do both from a, internal operations and what we do for our clients. So we're very fortunate in terms of uh, environmental, uh, you know, uh, that, that have environmental issues, that have social issues and governance issues. And our whole business plan is to provide that service and those professional services to those clients so that they can implement those. We look at it in a couple different ways. We look at the different processes. So from a governance standpoint, our board is very much involved. Um, from a procurement, what we do internally in terms of people issues, in terms of uh, subcontractors, we, we look at that. And then we look at those, those 60,000 projects that we do every year. What do we do to enhance uh, the benefits to our clients in terms of uh, environmental issues and social issues? Now, I think one of the, th one of the themes that um, you'll hear from me tonight, you may not hear you know, in, in, your, in your classroom or you may not hear um, in, in some of the lectures, but it's, it's not just environmental, social, and governance issues, but it's also the environmental issue or the uh, economics issue. And the economics is important because you need to be able to measure what the benefit is of what you're doing. So for you, the accounting majors in here, you're gonna go out and you're gonna, you're gonna measure what is the financial results of the company? How did they do? How did they perform? It's the same thing with um, these ESG factors. What you need to do is you need to be able to figure out how to, what you want to measure and then measure to figure out have you been successful? Um, or do you need to do more work to be successful? And from an internal standpoint, we look at our, our real estate. So we have 400 offices around the world. Information technology, uh, one of the things we've, we've done over the last couple of years is we've taken out all of our servers and all of our offices and we've moved all that uh, technology to the cloud. It saved lots of energy, it saved um, you know, manpower, it's, it's uh, you know, saved cost. Um, health and safety, I think a couple of the uh, social and governance issues that are really important to pub not, uh, not just public companies but all companies is what are the benefits to our employees? How do we keep them safe? How do we uh, you know, have, a, have a great working environment and uh, so we, we, we do spend a lot of time on those social and governance issues. Uh, same thing with human resources and, um, uh, and, and the communications that we have out, like this event and others, to the community. So like I said, there's wanted to go through just real briefly, how does Tetra Tech implement the ESG uh, areas? And it's, it's uh, really three areas. One is projects. So projects that we do for our clients every single day, um, our own internal operations in terms of, uh, you know, doing uh, what we do for our clients, we do that internally, and then uh, reaching out to the communities, and and again as a uh, uh, as, as Larry indicated, as a uh, accounting major and liking to measure things and and uh, always measuring the financial results. We also take a look at what we do for on these projects what we do internally, what we do out in the communities, so that we can measure uh, what we've done. So if people know that they're accountable to um, reach certain goals, you need to set those goals, you need to, uh, um, and then figure out how to measure those goals to make sure that you're actually getting what you're setting out for. 
So a couple, couple projects that um, I wanted to share with you in terms of uh, what we do for our clients. The first is, uh, and these are similar, one of the things that's where we've seen a lot of growth in our business is water reuse. So in California, Texas, Florida, uh, Arizona, lots of states that, uh, you know, we count on water coming, being pumped in from faraway places. Um, you know, a lot of times that water is, is, is used and it's treated and it's, you know, flushed out to the ocean. I think one of the things that's, that's currently happening, especially in California, is this idea of water, or, um, water reuse. So in parks and in, in other areas, what we've been doing with our clients is actually figuring out how to capture that water, how to treat that water, and how to reuse it versus just you know, flushing it out through the, uh, through the ocean. The second thing is, as uh, probably many of you uh, LMU students know, as, uh, as, you, as we live close to the beach, what happens when it rains in Southern California? All the beaches shut down because everything's polluted. And so one of the things that we're doing for the city of Santa Monica, the city of Los Angeles, is taking that water and that runoff and actually trying to figure out how to reroute that water, clean it, and then put it back into, uh, you know, reusing it back into uh, the water systems th themselves rather than having it, you know, the polluted water just um, run out of here locally at, at Bologna Creek or uh, um, Santa Monica Bay. I think um, a couple of other things. I, um, one of the questions was, do we do environmental remediation or do we help our clients figure out how to not, not pollute? And um, one of the things that Tetra Tech is, has done over the years, and we've been really successful doing this, is we've actually figured out and worked with our clients on how to take polluted property, in this case, uh, you know, oil fields up in Canada, where the oil sludge was just, you know, dumped onto the land, how to clean that up and then make it useful for, um, in this case, wildlife. Um, one of our biggest projects that we have is a sediment remediation uh, project in, at a river up in Green Bay, where for, you know, 30, 40 years, um, old paper companies were just depositing their waste into the river causing the river to uh, just become sludge. You, you couldn't swim in it, you couldn't uh, go in into it. And so we've, we've been spending the last eight years cleaning the river up to bring it back to its uh, natural use and, and uh, you know, actually be able to swim and not, not get out of the water with, you know, a third eye or something like that. So that's, that's what we do for our clients, um, you know, day in and day out in terms of water issues and environmental issues. Um, in terms of cleaning things up and, and making things better. But just as important is, what are we doing for um, designing sustainable infrastructure for the future? So one, one of our large projects, and we've been working on this for a couple of years and it's, it's progressing, is we're actually helping to design a city from the ground up um, in, in Kenya. And this is gonna be a city that's um, energy efficient you know, creating its own energy, using its own energy, um, having a water water system that's able to reuse all of the wastewater internally, and um, uh, and then having very little waste that that needs to be you know going out to a landfill. So this is um, not not just from an ESG perspective, but from also from a uh, technology um, perspective. And and one day, once it all gets built, still in the design phase. Um, it'll, it'll house 200,000 people that'll be able to live and work in that area with uh, almost fully sustainable. That's the goal. Other things is um, actually working with um, uh, the DOD. That's, that's one of our large, large clients. And if you look at how many uh, uh, Navy, Air Force, Marine base, uh, Navy bases, if, if, if you look at how much energy those, those locations use, and you think about um, they're all very, you know, basically they're small cities that, that are sitting there. What, what can we do and what are we doing for our client, the DOD, to allow them to become more energy efficient? So these are, these are all projects that I, I chalk up as um, environmental issues, uh, but also governance issues. Uh, if you were a Fortune 500 company and, and you could have spent a couple million dollars over the last 30 years um, keeping the river clean, that would have been a much better financial return than 
having to spend a billion dollars over the next 10 years to actually clean it up. So what else do we do? Um, energy consumption. We work with a lot of clients, uh, um, small, small school districts. Uh, we, for the Port of Los Angeles and the Port of New York, we, uh, we lead their clean trucks program. So if you think about how many trucks are coming in and out, loading and unloading uh, the cargo ships every day, um, that's a lot of trucks and, and that's a lot of pollution. So we've been working with the ports to transition all those polluting trucks to energy efficient, uh, clean, clean fuels uh, vehicles. I think, um, you know, uh, one, one of the questions I had also, uh, so if, for those of you that don't know, so I went to you know, Loyola High School, I went to Santa Clara University. Um, one of the professors asked me uh, earlier tonight, um, how, did the, how did the Jesuits impact you in, in what you do every single day? And uh, I won't tell you all the bad stuff because it, there's a lot of alcohol involved, <laughs> if you know the Jesuits. <laughs> but I would tell you that, that uh, uh, there's no Jesuits here, are there? Okay. <laughs> no. Um, uh, but one of, one of the things that, that stayed with me or, uh, you know, hit me and still stays with me are a lot of the social issues, you know, being a man for others and, um, and, and working at Tetra Tech and being able to identify social issues that, that really make a, a difference in people's lives and knowing that our company does these things every single day is, is a great thing. So one of the things is, and it, it doesn't look like much, but um, working in different developing countries, um, working with different, call it tribes, call it communities, what, what have you, but helping them become more um, independently sustainable in terms of water and energy. Um, just basic things that you walk around school every day, you, you go to the tap, you get a water, you turn on the lights, you get your energy. That's not the case in, in a lot of African communities or South American communities. So one of the things that we do is work in those communities uh, through USAID or through another um, aid agency in either the UK or, or Australia. And we're able to develop water and energy systems um, for the people to become more independent. And one of the social issues has always been, it's always been um, in a lot of these African countries, the, the, the girl's job from a very early age to go to the river, get the clean water, and bring it back to the family to use. And you do that a couple times a day while the boys get to go to school, get an education, and the girls are left behind. And so by looking at, at doing these projects in terms of water issues, environmental issues, um, it, it allows you know a lot more people, male and female, to um, you know to really you know make a difference in their lives and, and give them the ability to get an education and do something other than just you know um, go get the water every day for the family. So that's those are some of the things that we do from a uh, not just an environmental side but but also a uh, a social side. So th those were, I'll call it a, uh, a 30,000 foot level um, idea or, 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 you know, to give you a, a little taste of what we do for our clients, what we do for projects. But just as important, what we do for our clients. So what we talk about, you know, we need to walk the walk, talk the talk. Um, it can't just be, uh, you know, we, we do this, this, and this. We need to be able to prove that we do this, um, do the same things in terms of, um, you know, benefiting the environment. So back in 2010, they got implemented in 2011, we actually started a formal process internally where we wanted to measure what do we do in our operations to um, have an impact on the environment, to take a look at, um, so we, we selected a bunch of different criteria, we set standards in terms of what we could, you know, what we wanted to measure and then we set out to measure those. So a couple things, I won't bore you with everything, but all of our offices across the world, you know, we're focused on um, saving 40% of the water that we use, you know, in 2010 to compare to 2016. That was our goal. 
and you know it's uh, landscaping sinks low flush toilets it's it's you know er everything that you can think of um, just as important as energy consumption um, what do we need to do to reduce our costs reduce the you know energy and um, um, make that a measurable um, item that people get we'll call it better or worse get graded upon at, at, at the end of um, that five years another another area with that, that um, as a corporation we use lots of paper we have lots of Xerox machines um, what do we need to do to decrease the amount of paper that we use or how do we actually take our plastic water bottles or the paper that we don't need and get that reused and recycled so those were some of the areas that we did we uh, took a look at from a uh, you know internal operations side um, you know and just as important to that as that is you know, we have we have a lot of really smart people um, you know we have 16,000 employees most of those employees are scientists they're engineers they're biologists they're they've got PhDs um, so very very fortunate people to have an education and have a uh, you know a lifestyle that that's a great lifestyle um, but that also means that you have a responsibility so one of the areas that we look at from a social and a governance standpoint is what do we need to do out in the communities and so uh, we actually measure that too not not because we want to pat ourselves on the back but because we want to make sure that people know this is something that's uh, that's expected from all of our employees and so when we look at um, where we spend our money, where we spend our time, about 90% of that is focused on environmental, social, and governance issues. Um, and with that, we, um, we have a, a, a partnership with Engineers Without Borders that um, you know, many of our employees take anywhere from two to four weeks off every year. Um, they, they volunteer their time. Uh, we, we support that. And we also support Engineers Without Borders from a financial standpoint, too, by taking on one big project every year and, um, and seeing that, that uh, you know, it, it does a uh, developing country or community some, some good. One of the things that we started uh, last year, started here in, you know, L.A. County with, uh, with the mayor and, and um, 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 and then it's spread throughout the company is reaching out to grade schools for STEM, uh, getting people interested in science, technology, uh, you know, engineering, math. And so uh, that's, that's been a, uh, um, it wasn't, we, we didn't start in 2010 with the rest of this, but we started last year and it's, it's an area that uh, uh, the, the company, especially one like Tetra Tech supports. So just to let you, you know, so as I talked about, we do have a report card. We do want to you know, look at what, we, what we've done. And, um, and at the end of the day, we actually break this out into what are environmental issues, what are social issues, what are governance issues that are all part of our internal sustainability report card. And I'm, I'm happy to say, and, and you'll see this in our, uh, uh, our next report card that we put out is, we actually surpassed every one of our metrics that we set out to do five years ago. And, uh, you know, that's, that's, that's good. We, we, you know, we, we succeeded, we, we surpassed our expectations. Um, but it's also bad because now the, the bar is set higher and now we have to do more. Uh, but we're, we're up to the challenge and, and uh, you know, it's, uh, it's gratifying that, that between the projects that you do for clients, between the outreach to communities, and what you do in your internal operations to make a difference, um, you're able to measure that and say, hey, I, I was successful. No different than um, you know, studying for midterms and, and doing well and you know, going home and showing mom I got an A, not, not uh, hiding the report card and not letting them know what I did. So one of the things that um, uh, Larry had talked about and, and when I was, uh, so I was on a, uh, uh, a panel talking to a bunch of people that sit on board of directors in, in Southern California. And the topic was the political and regulatory environment 
and, and how that's impacting corporations and environmental and social issues. And uh, so he asked me to give my thoughts on this. And, and uh, you know, I, I got to tell you, the, the first two sections of this were easy to talk about. It was all about Tetradeck. It was all about the company I've worked for the last 14 years and, and helped to lead. Um, this is, uh, so I was talking to my uh, IR guys and helping put this presentation together. Uh, you know, part of the stories were uh, uh, riots happening on Berkeley campus, uh, uh, picketing going on. So th this presentation is, is not to, to incite any riots. It's not to be on the Channel 7 News. Um, I'm not going to give you my political, uh, you know, left leaning or right leaning ideas. It's uh, just taking different things that have, you know, been in the news that we all see over the last couple of weeks, over the last couple of months. Um, I could have updated this all day to day with everything that, that happened the last couple of days, but I, uh, I decided to stick with what, what I had finished about last week. And um, just to, to talk a little bit about what is out there in the political and regulatory environment and, and how does it impact businesses and, 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 and government. So, you know, several months ago, President Trump said he agreed, he was going to agree to uh, withdraw from the, the Paris Accord. A lot of talk. Well, what happened on the heels right after that? Our, our Governor Brown said, I'm going to double down and I'm going to increase the environmental protection you know, in California. And I'm going to do more to save the planet. A lot of talk, but so far, n no action. A lot of rhetoric. Trump also, uh, um, and I know this uh, firsthand because uh, we do a lot of work for the EPA. So when President Trump came out and said, I'm going to slash the EPA budget, I'm going to cut the, the environmental regulations, um, we're going to basically choke uh, the environmentalists off. Um, we actually saw our stock price decrease um, that day. We didn't do anything other than Trump said he was going to cut, cut the funding for the EPA. Um, what's really happening, or what the real impact is, is um, the, 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 the amount of grassroots activities that have occurred since then to just do just the opposite in terms of protecting the water and pr protecting the environment. Um, we're actually seeing local uh, environmental rules uh, start going through the process where they're actually increasing um, at the local level uh, just to offset what Trump and, and, and others want to do at the federal level. Yet there's been no action, there's been no reduction in the EPA, and, and things are just status quo as we, as we sit here about a year after uh, the election. Um, America first. I think one of the things was that, that's been constant throughout is America first, you know, protectionism. And as, a, uh, as, as you heard and as you saw some of the projects we do funded through USAID for these African and uh, South American developing countries, we, we, we get our funding to be able to do that work from USAID. And so one of the questions that would always come to us is, hey, Trump's going to cut USAID. It's America first, a lot of rhetoric, but the reality is, as you can see here, we actually saw, or USAID saw, a slight increase in their funding for 17 compared to the prior years. So again, um, not a lot of impact from, I'll, I'll call it the political and regulatory environment yet, yet it still could happen. I think, um, one of the things that's, that's really important to understand is uh, whether you're Democrat, Republican, um, you know, the, the environmental issues are, you know, go, goes without political bounds. And when one of the things we looked at is when you look at what uh, Schwarzenegger put into effect when he was governor of California, uh, he increased the environmental regulations and everybody said it was going to kill business. Brown came along and you know, doubled down and did more. But when you look at California and the GDP per employee or per person, it's actually increased $5,000 more per year compared to the rest of the country, while, um, you know, the, the greenhouse gas has actually decreased 12% more 
than the rest of the country. So what, you know, what was supposed to be a, a dire result from these environmental regulations on business has actually had the opposite effect over these you know, uh, two governors. And so that, that gets to this point, which is um, environmental issues and, and regulations are actually good for business. They've been good for our business over the last 50 years, and they're good for you know, some of the more, more recent business startups. So for instance, in the last five years, for every one fossil fuel job that was created in California, eight and a half renewable energy jobs were created during that same time period. And so this is no coincidence that because of these environmental issues and because of the increased regulations, um, whereby, uh, I'll probably get this wrong, but by the year 2030, you know, a certain, you know, 50% of the cars have to be electric cars in California, something ridiculous, right? And so what that's, what that's doing is it's actually causing or creating a lot more innovation, a lot more technologies going into how to solve these problems and how to get to that point. And so Tesla is, you know, I don't know how old they are, eight, nine years at the most, if, if that. And they've got a valuation that's, you know, in the, in the top 100 in the country because they, they're figuring out how to use technology, how to be innovative to solve different environmental and social uh, and even governance issues. And so where does that lead? So, so it's, it's nice to say, okay, you've got this billionaire that starts this company wants to do this. Um, but there's other trillions of dollars out there that actually the funds that are needed to start these companies or fund these public companies or even private companies before you go public. That's what these funds are. You know, black, some of the big ones, BlackRock, <laughs> Fidelity, State Street. And what we've seen over the last, uh, you know, four years, from 2014 to 2016, you've seen an actual increase in the amount of funds that are going into um, ESG-directed funds. So these, these are funds that part of the criteria is they have to invest in companies that are focused on environmental, social, and governance issues. That's it, with other, with other certain criteria. And so what we've seen is that the funds going into those, or the, the money going into those funds has actually increased. And since 2016 into 2017, has actually gone up 70% year over year. So why is that important? I'll uh, get to this. Why it's important is because um, you, it, it's, it's great to talk about theoretically how do you solve environmental issues, how do you solve social issues, governance issues, right, ESG. Um, but what is the economic impact and what is the, what is the payback for investing in those areas? Um, as a public company, I can tell you, I would not be standing up here as the CFO if we lost money every year, if our revenues went down every year. Um, I wouldn't have my job. My, jo my job is to create value for our shareholders and see, a, see an increase in the stock price. Some would say that's my only job. Um, I would tell you that supporting our clients, um, supporting every one of those projects, and making a, a difference to our clients is just as important because that puts us in a leadership position that helps create uh, a vehicle to increase our revenue and do more for our clients. And therefore, if we can do that, then we, uh, we can uh, add value to our shareholders. So again, um, just going back to uh, you know, what is ESG, remember it's, it's not just those, those three letters, but it's also the ethical part of, of doing what you want to do, but also it's the economics of how do you, how do you make it economical? How do you have a, a uh, return to your shareholders? So when we, when we looked at this, um, as you can see here, every one out of every five dollars or 20 percent of money that's go new money that's going into um, mutual funds, into uh, uh, trust funds, into your 401ks, it's going into some sort of ESG fund or related fund. And if you look at um, 
what, what investors want. Uh, so when you look at, at, at the largest shareholders or the largest funds out there, you know, there are hundreds of billions of dollars and they have the ability to, to attract funding from individuals that, like all of us here, like your parents, um, uh, and, and use those funds to go out and do analysis of companies that they think are gonna have a higher return and are gonna make, um, you know, take a dollar and turn it into $2 in a year. Um, but what do those, those funds really look at in terms of how do, how do they invest and, and what is their basis for investing in companies like Tetratech? Well, they do, they do two things. One is um, they take a look at, at companies like Tetratech and others that kind of check the box and all the ESG criteria, or um, they become activists and they, they meet with companies and they try to get things on the proxy to force the companies to act in a certain way you know, the way they, they want you to um, govern the company. But as you can see, the, uh, um, from, from 1995, you know, it was less than, uh, you know, a trillion dollars to, uh, to over eight trillion dollars is, uh, is what's actually being invested in um, ESG type companies. So there's a lot, lot of different things in terms of how does a company apply and, and um, these ESG factors uh, from a corporate from a corporate governance standpoint? You've got board diversity. Um, there's a lot a lot more women on board of directors uh, now. Um, Anti-corruption policies. The last thing you want is to have no policies, no governance, and uh, and have a governance uh, culture that puts you on the uh, the front page of the Wall Street Journal and you become the next Uber, where one day you're, you're flying high, and the next day you're losing all your business to Lyft because you have a poor governance culture. That's, that's part of uh, you know, ESG there. Also on the social side, um, looking at, at the workplace, looking at your workplace safety, looking at community development, keeping employees um, you know, uh, safe at work and keeping, keeping employees uh, um, interested in coming to work every day. It's, it's a big issue. And then the environmental side, you know, I, I talked about that a lot um, with, with the projects that we do, um, but it is important. It's, and it's not just cleaning up things that have occurred, but trying to figure out and using technology to figure out how do we not create those problems in the future. So, what do, what, do, uh, what do investors look at when they, when they look at investing in a company like Tetratech? You know, first of all, they look at that, those, all those uh, different factors that I talked about before. They look at those from a qualitative standpoint. They say, does this company meet these different criteria? So first and foremost, that's what they look at. Second, or third, however you want to call it, um, if, if you're an oil and gas company, they don't invest in you. If you're a nuclear company, they don't invest in you. If you've done, if you've had a uh, poor governance uh, record, and your your management and your board is out of control, um, you know they don't invest in you. So these factors are not. It's not hard dollars. It's more intangible. Um, but those intangible factors are becoming just as important as the tangible financial factors. And so who's, you know, so where's the money coming from? So when, when I, uh, you know, I'll use myself as, a, as an example. You know, I'm an older person. I've saved a lot of money. Um, the mutual funds and the investments I've, I've made over the years, they've all been, you know, the GEs, the, the, uh, the General Motors, the Fords, a lot of industrial companies, uh, financial firms, right? But I'm getting ready to retire, so I need to put my money into cash. So I'm going to be taking my money out of these larger, you know, Fortune 500 industrial companies that, that have been around for a long time. And where the money that's coming into to a lot of these funds, like BlackRock and State Street and, and some of these other, you know, billion-dollar funds, they're coming from yourselves, you know, millennials um, that that are just are entering the workforce, starting a 401k plan and saying, 
where do I want to invest my, my money? It's not in, it's not my dad's company. Uh, I hear that all the time. It's, it's in, you know, high technology and, and companies that are focused on ESG issues. Um, the, and, and when you look at, um, or when we look at, um, you know, what the effect is, it's, it's really no different than, you know, economics. It's, there's a supply and there's a demand. That demand is coming from dollars that are being invested and the supply of companies like Tetra Tech and others is just not that great. And so, um, so what are companies trying to do? They're trying to make themselves, they're, they're developing um, ESG standards, they're doing the self-reporting, they're showing their report cards on what great you know, corporate citizens they are. Um, and so if you look from 2011, the number of um, public companies that actually had these ESG reporting or report cards was about 20%. But people are figuring out, or companies are figuring out, especially board of directors are figuring out, if you wanna be a highly valued company, you're, you're going to have to, you know, do this reporting. You're going to have to show how how are you benefiting um, the greater good from an ESG standpoint. And so more and more companies are um, putting, you know, or are uh, reporting on these either in their financial filings with the SEC or just you know straight up on their uh, on their uh, websites. Now, there's a lot of standards, um, I think, uh, but there's, there's no one standard out there, especially for public companies. So for uh, you accounting majors that, that are going through uh, financial reporting, you know, there's SEC guidelines, there's GAAP guidelines, everybody has to follow the same rules. Uh, for, for these ESG factors, there isn't that one standard yet. There's lots of standards and nothing is required. Um, may that change in the future? Probably. Um, Will it change uh, in the next 10 years before I retire? Uh, probably not. And so what makes, what makes a, uh, a company valuable? It's uh, like I talked about before. It's the financial performance. It's the tangible factor. It's you know, how you grow your revenue, how you create the cash flow, how you create a, uh, a return uh, for your investors in terms of profitability. Those, those are the tangible factors. The intangible piece is, um, it's probably no different than most of the students here in terms of uh, getting, getting good grades, getting a 4.0. Uh, that 4.0, you can't go to Starbucks across the street and buy a latte with it. Um, but with the good grades, and that, that's the intangible factor, a company's gonna come on campus, they're gonna recruit you because you're a great person, you got great grades, and they're gonna give you a job making a half million dollars a year. That's the intangible factor. <laughs> that's, that's what Larry said you guys are starting your, uh, starting salaries at, out of this business school. But that's, that's the intangible factor. So the, the higher value, the higher value that, that you can show somebody that you have a future, that you're creating value that's maybe not tangible, maybe not dollars and cents, but is, um, shows a promise and a future, that's the intangible factor. And so you need to take both of those to determine how do I, how do I get a higher value for my company? Like Tesla. Tesla's making no money. They're losing money every year, yet I don't know what their value is, Jim, probably $100 billion, something like that. Tetradyke's been around for 50 years, and our market cap is almost $3 billion. Tesla has never made a dime, and they're valued over $100 billion. And it's all because of that intangible piece. And so um, this is, uh, you know, 80, when, you look at, when you look at a balance sheet of a company, 80% of it is, is intangibles. Um, only 20% of it, if you shut the doors and you liquidated everything, would you get you know, 20, per, 20 cents on the dollar if you liquidated a company and just shut down and, and uh, took your balance sheet and cashed out? So, and why is, why is this important? So when we, uh, when we take a look at 
what are some of the things that even make the slightest difference? Because if, you're, if you can get your stock price up an extra 10% a year compared to your peers, that's a big deal. When, when, when the average you know, stock price over the last couple of years you know, goes up 7 to 10%, yet you can get, do that plus a little extra just by making these changes. Um, so for instance, we saw that, or we've seen that um, firms that have an increasing number of women and, and women in, in management, um, their stock price has an alpha of about 3.3%. Uh, that means they're doing 3.3% better than their uh, competitors. When you look at companies that are actually um, uh, implementing and actually doing this in terms of saving water, saving energy, uh, there's about a 2.6% alpha and a 1.8% for water. And then employee turnover, the social and governance issues, keeping your employees safe, creating a, a work environment that where they want to come to work, um, and having that lower turnover makes a big difference too, um, almost a 1% difference. So, you know, why, why is this important and why is it, you know, uh, I guess my, my point to, to all of you here is one of the things you got to think about is um, why, why do you want to invest in a um, you know, company like Tetra Tech? Um, why do you, what, what's happening that, that's going to be different 10 years from now than today in terms of where you want to invest your dollars, where do you want to invest your 401k so you have a good retirement? It's, it's really in companies that have uh, good risk management, um, are able to mitigate problems. Companies that are innovative, um, especially related to um, environmental and social issues. Um, cost savings, uh, you, you can read this. And as a company, if, if you ignore these things, if you ignore these intangible factors that are there and are only focused on you know, straight dollars and cents, you, your company will be worth less tomorrow than them. Um, than your competitors who are focused on this. And so um, as a, uh, uh, you know, I like to, uh, as the CFO for Tetra Tech, I like to toot my own horn or our, our collective horn for, you know, all 16,000 employees. So when you look at Tetra Tech from 1991 to 2016, so the first 25 years of being a public company, we've had over a 3,000% 3, return to our shareholders from the time we went IPO to now compared to you know the average of the Nasdaq Dow Jones and S&P and so my, my point here is is um, um, and I'll turn over to questions if there are questions but it's it's not it's not just um, you know going out into the business world and, and creating a company that, that makes a lot of money or has a lot of wow, wow factor, but it's, um, it's the combination of both being financially um, rewarding to your employees and to your investors and having that intangible factor where you're focused on the right things um, um, and, and being, and, but you gotta, be, you gotta make, um, you gotta have a good cash flow and you gotta have a good return in order to afford to, uh, you know, put those ESG items in place. Um, so that's that's it. So hopefully, uh, yeah, thanks. I was able to, to keep, keep you guys awake. So. Uh,